Good afternoon. The first item of business today is portfolio questions, and we start with question number one from Annie Wills. To ask the Scottish Government what action it has taken since the publication of the Scottish Information Commissioner's Intervention Report, which found that it was operating a two-tier system for managing FOI requests that discriminated against journalists, MSPs and researchers. Minister Graham D. Uh, thank you. The Commissioner's report explicitly acknowledges that the Scottish Government has made changes in the last 12 months that have already resulted in significant improvements to our FOI performance. On the day that the Commissioner published his report, we updated our guidance to state unambiguously that clearance should be based on the sensitivity of information requested rather than the identity of the requester. This states explicitly that not all requests from journalists, political researchers or MSPs will be for sensitive information. On September the 13th, we published a draft action plan for the Commissioner's consideration. This aims to address all of his recommendations and to build on an improving performance. I look forward to the Commissioner's feedback on the plan and on working with him during its implementation. Annie Wells. I thank the Minister for that response. As the Minister will be aware, the report found that a number of cases featuring unjustifiable significant delays with disregard for statutory timescales. Can the Minister um, now say that the Scottish Government is now fully compliant with FOI legislation? Minister. The, as I have said earlier, the Scottish Government is in dialogue with the Commissioner, having provided uh, the uh, information that he was required by way of response to the recommendations. Um, it, the performance in terms of turning an FOI request around has been significantly higher than it was previously over the last six months. So, in short, the answer is yes, I do. Annie Wills. No. James Dornan. Thank you, President Officer. I hope you weren't getting us mixed up there. The, uh, can, can I just say that... <laughs> no disrespect intended, Annie, sorry. <laughs> But isn't it the case, Minister, that the Information Commissioner acknowledged the Scottish Government has taken those steps, as you've already mentioned, to improve and monitor its performance, and that this improvement should be judged against a backdrop of increasing number of requests? Minister. Paragraph uh, 20 of the Commissioner's report highlighted the significant improvement in the Scottish Government's performance against that backdrop of increasing numbers of requests. In 2017, we received 3,046 requests, 41% more than the previous high in 2015. This shows no sign of diminishing presiding officer. We're currently on course to receive around 3,500 requests in 2018. By way of a specific example of what's being dealt with, on the afternoon of the 12th of September, one individual submitted 84 requests in the space of 56 minutes. That's one every 48 seconds. Despite this continued high volume in the first seven months of 2018, we've responded to 93% of requests in time, above the target of 90%. And I pay tribute to the diligence and hard work of the staff across government for delivering this. Jackie Bailey. The Scottish Government's draft action plan on FOI handling includes the creation of criteria to define sensitive or complex cases. Could I ask the Minister what measures will be used to identify a case as sensitive and how will he ensure that the identity of the requester is not known? Minister. Presiding Officer, I I'll come back uh, with further detail on this in due course. What I can give a commitment to Jackie Bailey and to other members is we work, are continuing to work very closely to satisfy the Commissioner as to the nature of our response, uh, and I'm extremely hopeful that we will reach that point, meeting all of the recommendations that he's made. Question number two, Willie Rennie. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what its position is on there being a UK-wide referendum on the final terms of the Brexit deal. Cabinet Secretary Michael Russell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I assure the member in the chamber the Scottish Government is not opposed to a second referendum on the final negotiated deal if that's the will of the UK Parliament? However, we are concerned that those in favour of such a vote have not demonstrated how they would address a serious democratic challenge that if the people of Scotland voted clearly and decisively to remain within the European Union, as they did in the 2016 referendum, they would still not face being removed from the EU against their will. As the First Minister said in this chamber last week, if the Scottish Government is to get enthusiastically behind the campaign for another EU vote, surely it is not unreasonable to ask for a guarantee that Scotland would not find itself in the same position all over again if it votes to remain within the EU. Willie Rennie. Uh, the problem for the Cabinet Secretary is that time is running out. He's been talking about these talks for months now. He and I have had uh, talks on several occasions. 
I mean, to be, to be brutal, what he wants is he wants me to back independence if he backs a people's vote on Brexit. That's what he's trying to get to, and that is not going to happen. So the Cabinet Secretary has a decision to make. Will he sit on the sidelines, or will he get behind the best chance of stopping Brexit, which is a people's vote? Stop hiding behind the talks and do the right thing. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'm, I'm not sure Mr Rennie is doing his own case much good by essentially saying, back us or else. Now, fortunately, there are more reasonable and more sensible voices who are arguing for this. For example, I had a very constructive discussion this morning with Hugo Dixon from the People's Vote, uh, which was an interesting and informative step forward. Uh, and that is the type of constructive engagement which I would commend to Mr Rennie. Uh, I did note that his party leader, I think he's still his party leader, uh, Vince Cable, uh, at the start of the Liberal Democrat conference, demanded that the SNP back the people's vote, but also demanded that the people of Scotland should never be allowed to support independence again. That is no way to win friends and influence people. June McAlpine. Thank you. This week we learned that post-Brexit pet owners who wish to take their animals to Europe will face barriers in acquiring a pet passport. In the event of a no deal, they need to have met with a vet by November this year to guarantee travel after March 2019. Does the Minister agree with, me, agree with me that this is callous, disruptive and should have been avoided? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, I do. The UK Government's technical notices, the third tranche of which were published this week, do expose more starkly than anything else we've seen how disastrous and ridiculous a no-deal Brexit could be. The UK Government's own guidance couldn't be clearer about the chaos and disruption that will ensue. It can be, and it could be, avoided. The Prime Minister should put an end to her brinkmanship at the present moment and should uh, commit to the only feasible option, short of continued EU membership, which I favour, as does Mr Rennie, is to stay in the European single market and the customs union. Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, President Officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that if Remainers like Willie Rennie had voted yes in the independence referendum four years ago, Scotland would not now be leaving the European Union? And that the only way Scotland will have a future in the European Union is as an independent sovereign nation. Cabinet Secretary. Well, indeed, I, I would hope, though there's no sign of it, that Mr Rennie does have, uh, does have voters' remorse, that he considers that he made a major mistake. Perhaps he was misled, of course, by the, uh, another party leader, by the, uh, Ruth Davidson, who said in a debate, in a point raised by Patrick Harvey, who's unfortunately not here, uh, that no means out and yes means in, in which the opposite is true. No means, she said, we stay in. This was the view of the leader of the Scottish Conservatives. It turns out not to be true. And in those, circum in those circumstances, if Mr Rennie had uh, the conviction that he claims to have, he would be backing independence all the way. Question number three, Finlay Carson. To ask the Scottish Government whether it's been in contact with the Welsh Government since last week's Joint Ministerial Committee meeting. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government routinely engages with counterparts in the Welsh Government on a range of business between both officials and ministers. Since the meeting of the Joint Ministerial Committee EU negotiations on the 13th September, the Scottish Ministers met with the Welsh Ministers at both the Ministerial Forum EU negotiations and the DEFRA Devolved Administration Quadrilateral Ministerial meeting in London on the 17th September, and officials have been in touch since those meetings. Finley Carson. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. Uh, further to that, I note that the Scottish Government's programme for government pledges obstinacy on all further legislative consent memorandums regarding Brexit, Brexit legislation. Can the Minister please tell me if he's had the chance to discuss that position with the Welsh Government? The Welsh Government are, are fully aware of our position on the Sewell Convention, and it is a reasonable and reasoned position to take. The Sewell Convention is broken. The UK Government have not operated as it meant to be operated. In all these circumstances, it's important that it comes back into, into play in an effective way. The Sewell Convention never said that consent meant either voting for something or not voting for it or saying nothing. Until the Sewell Convention has meaning, then we cannot go along with any process that involves it. However, I'm not an unreasonable person. And what I've suggested to David Liddington in recent weeks, as the member may know, is a means by which we can resolve this. The Welsh Government knows that, and the Welsh Government indicated that they supported that solution the last time we discussed it. So, if we could all agree on it, we could move forward. Question number four, Maureen Watt. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions that it has, has had with the fish processing industry regarding the impact of Brexit on people from the EU working in the sector. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, presiding officer, on the 16th of August, the First Minister convened a seafood sector roundtable on Brexit. 
where she met with key stakeholders in the seafood industry to discuss the impacts of Brexit on their sectors, including the processing sector. One of the main concerns expressed was future access to migrant labour, given the processing sector's reliance on it, with figures showing 58% of the workforce is non-UK EEA workers. That's why it's vital that any future trading arrangements for our seafood exports to the EU continue to be free of tariff and non-tariff barriers. Maureen Watt. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Does he agree with me that the MAC report re recommendation that low-skilled workers should be encouraged to enter the UK on a youth mobility scheme could lead to all lower-paid workers being paid even less and needs to be revised in order to protect those working in vital industries such as the fish processing industry in Aberdeen South, in North Kincardine and elsewhere. Yeah, I, I do agree with her and I, with the member and I also agree on uh, issues of the MAC report. The MAC report is immensely disappointing. Yet again, MAC has refused to even acknowledge the existence of a separate Scottish economy and separate Scottish labour force needs. It's not the first time that's happened. I hope it might be the last. Now, in these circumstances, some of the proposals they make are, are frankly visible. Uh, for example, the solution that could be adopted to some of the labour shortages is to uh, change the retiral age. The prospect of people who are uh, ready to draw their uh, old age pension being sent out into the fields of Angus to pick uh, fruit uh, is a ridiculous one. And the uh, Migration Advisory Committee need to, as my old granny would have said, take a jump to themselves. They need to look at what the situation in Scotland, they need to understand the Scottish labour market. Then their contributions might be of some help. Peter Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I echo the concerns of Maureen Watt and the CAB Secretary. Uh, labour is vital for the future success of these industries. And on these benches, we support the UK government in getting the best deal for our fishermen. And we support the fishermen's desire to take back control of our waters and catch a fair share of fish within our 200 miles. With this in mind, we need to ensure Scotland has the capacity to process increased fish landings. And with a 34% decline in fish processing in Scotland due to high business rates, <coughs> driving business down south, what is this government going to do to encourage these businesses to remain in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. There are, presiding officer, none so blind as those who will not see. The facts of this matter were laid out by Maureen Watt. It would be useful if the member listened to those facts and not brought to the chamber uh, garbage and prejudice, which is what we've just heard. The reality of this situation is that Brexit is bearing down upon the processing sector in terms of an available labour force. Unless the member recognises that, then his contributions would be worthless. Question number five, Emma Harper. To ask the Scottish Government what support it provides for veterans. Minister Graeme Day. I thank you. Uh, yesterday, the Scottish Government published a report, Scottish Government Support for Veterans and the Armed Forces Community in Scotland, which highlights the work being taken forward across government, including in the areas of health, housing and employability. It also recognises that 2018 marks the 10th anniversary of investment in the Scottish Veterans Fund and the recent appointment of our new Scottish Veterans Commissioner, Colonel Charlie Walls, who will continue with the important role uh, which provides strategic advice and scrutiny that was previously undertaken by Eric Fraser. Tomorrow's scheduled debate will fulfil our promise to update Parliament on this topic annually and afford members an opportunity to discuss our report and highlight how we have taken forward the recommendations in Eric Fraser's report into veterans' health and well-being. Emma Harper. I welcome that answer from the Minister and I look forward to hearing more in due course. South West Scotland R&R, which is a charity based in Castle Douglas, aims to help veterans by empowering them to access employment and civil life. Recently, they have been providing funding for veterans to obtain HGV and SIA licences, as well as providing practical support for access to interviews and other social activities. Given this important work, can I ask if the Minister supports such a project and would he accept my invite to come and visit South West R&R to see for himself the important work which benefits veterans in the South West of Scotland? Minister. Uh, can, I, can I say to the member uh, that aiding veterans into employment so that they have a fulfilling life after they leave the armed forces is a priority for myself and my colleague, the Minister for Business, Fair Work and Skills. I therefore be delighted to consider an invitation to come and visit R&R. Question number six, James Jordan. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its involvement in negotiations on the EU withdrawal agreement. Cabinet Secretary Michael Rust. Standing officer, since the EU referendum, we've sought to engage meaningfully with the UK Government on withdrawal from the EU. We have, however, been frustrated by the quality of that engagement to date. 
There have been 11 meetings of JMCEN, including one on domestic issues, that is frameworks, four meetings of the Ministerial Forum, three meetings of the JMC Plenary. I remain concerned that some critical issues are outstanding, including finding an acceptable backstop on the Northern Ireland border and the crucial issue of maintaining protection for geographical indicators. Furthermore, it's vital that EU citizens know that their rights are secured. They still do not have that certainty. I attended the last meeting of the JMCEN on 13 September. I go, went on to make clear that the least damaging outcome for the UK is retaining membership of the European Single Market and the Customs Union if we do not remain in the EU. James Dornan. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Disappointing though it is about the, the level of discussion. Uh, obviously given the, the state of the two main parties around Brexit and the, the uncertainty that they're creating, could, there's obviously still some very significant issues outstanding. Not least, as you mentioned, finding an ex acceptable backstop in the Northern Ireland border with the Republic. If there was to be some kind of special deal for Northern Ireland, does the Cab Cabinet Secretary think that there should also be one for Scotland, which of course didn't vote for Brexit? Cabinet Secretary. Um, quite clearly, the issue of Northern Ireland it has to be treated in, in two ways. The first way is that we would do nothing, uh, nothing at all, to prejudice the, uh, a deal for Northern Ireland that secured peace, and that is what this is about. The Good Friday Agreement is at risk. Nobody who knows Northern Ireland anyway, and I know the member knows it well as I do, would doubt that the danger here is a return to violence and the issue of the border is crucial. So there has to be a deal in Northern Ireland and that deal has to be one that respects and indeed takes forward the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, but of course, any deal for Northern Ireland is a deal of differentiation. We've argued for a differentiated deal for Scotland since the beginning of this process and we published extensively upon it. A, a, deal, a differentiated deal for Northern Ireland that did not recognize the need for a differentiated deal for Scotland could be economically and socially very damaging indeed. So whilst we continue to recognize the special circumstances of Northern Ireland, we also recognize the special circumstances of Scotland in terms of our economy and the arguments we are making. And of course, another thing that joins us is that both Northern Ireland and Scotland voted decisively not to leave the EU. So there is a democratic imperative here too. James Kelly. Uh, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what impact assessments the government has carried out for the different scenarios that are likely to flow from the Supreme Court decision on the challenge to the government's continuity bill? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I think the member was present at the meeting of uh, the Finance and Constitution Committee where uh, I think uh, Mr Tompkins uh, suggested it wasn't a good idea to speculate about the outcome of a court case and I'm not going to speculate. I can assure the member we will be ready for uh, the, whatever outcome there is and I know that the Lord Advocate and myself will be more than ready to take forward whatever the outcome is. Adam Tompkins. Uh, thank you for letting off. So in terms of ne um, uh, negotiations with the UK government about Brexit, why does the minister not understand that demanding a whole series of vetoes on the exercise of powers which are properly reserved to Westminster is not an approach which is likely to achieve consensus when working with UK government colleagues? Well, perhaps, perhaps the member should advise his UK government colleagues to stop demanding vetoes in their part, because the Scottish government has never demanded a veto of any description on any item. What we, have sim what we have simply said is that there should be consultation and agreement should be found. The veto, the veto, the veto has been exercised by the UK government in terms, for example, of our continuity bill and its reference to the court. It's the UK government that believes it has the right to veto anything that this chamber does and indeed has done it in its redefinition of the word consent. So, uh, you know, the reality of the situation is it is the UK government through the UK parliament that is attempting to veto the rights, duties and obligations of this chamber. I'd be entirely happy if we sat down in partnership and worked in partnership towards a solution. I remain open to that. I hope the UK government does. They should stop vetoing. Question number seven, Rachel Hamilton. So to ask the Scottish Government when it last met the UK Government to discuss UK bills that contain proposals that impact on Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government is in regular contact with the UK Government about proposed UK legislation that might impact on Scotland. On the 30th September, I attended, as I've said, a meeting of the Joint Ministerial Committee on EU negotiations. At that meeting, the Scottish Government noted that whilst progress continues to be made where frameworks may be agreed, it won't bring forward further motions for legislative consent on EU exit-related bills without action being taken by the UK government to protect the Seoul Convention. That doesn't mean that engagement on the policy content of such bills is not taking place. It's clearly important that Scotland's perspective and the devolution settlement are both taken fully into account when these bills are being prepared. 
Rachel Hamilton. I thank the Minister for that answer. We recently saw the publication of the UK Agricultural Bill. The Welsh Government in Cardiff consented to the UK Government legislating on their behalf to allow a new regime to be created, something that the Scottish Government refused to do. The Scottish Government will now need to pass a separate bill in Holyrood to create a new subsidy programme. Can I ask, given that this is such an important bill, why have Scottish farmers been left in the dark? Why are there no plans to bring about an equivalent Scottish agricultural bill in the programme for government. Cameron Secretary. I have to say that for a representative of the Conservative Party to talk about people being left in the dark on Brexit <laughs> defies parody, I have to say. The reality of the situation is here, the Welsh Government have objected to issues in the Agriculture Bill as we have. There are certain issues such as the WTO issues which require resolution. What we are doing is trying to have a constructive discussion with the UK Government well, uh, strangely enough, Mr Tompkins, from a sedentary position, finds the idea of constructive discussion from the UK government funny. I have to say, I find it funny sometimes to think of the UK government as being constructive, but I'm doing my best and he should try. The reality of this situation is we'll continue to have those discussions, but there needs to be a proper exchange upon them. You cannot simply impose a bill. And this is the issue. This is the profound issue here. The Scottish Conservatives wish the Scottish government and the Scottish Parliament to accept anything that is said or done at Westminster and it will simply be imposed on them. Well, that may be how they do business. It ain't how we do business. Thank you. That concludes questions on government business and constitutional relations. We're now going to move on to questions on culture, tourism and external affairs. And we will start with question number one from Tom Mason. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I declare an interest as an Aberdeen City Councillor to ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of the impact of short-term lets on tourism levels in Aberdeen and other local authority areas. Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop. Uh, there's no single definition of a short-term let in Scotland, so there is no single official or definitive source of data that can be used to gauge the number of properties let on a short-term basis. I understand the pressure in some parts of the country for new controls over short-term letting of residential properties, and we want to address that. That is why in our programme for government, we have committed to working with local government, communities and business interests to ensure that local authorities have appropriate regulatory powers. This will ensure local authorities can take decisions that balance the needs and concerns of their communities with wider economic and tourism interests. A national solution allowing local authorities to protect the interests of local communities whilst providing a safe quality of experience for visitors must be based on the best possible evidence. We've already established a short-term lets delivery group of officials from across government to examine the issues around short-term letting. That group will consider the existing powers local authorities have and gather evidence as to whether further measures are required and we would welcome any evidence from City of Aberdeen Council or others. Tom Mason. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer. As you will be aware, short-term nets offer opportunities for those on low incomes and larger families to stay in Aberdeen, as well as adding to the diverse range of flexible and low-cost accommodation. Does she agree that for Aberdeen, short-term nets are essential in boosting the local economy, given the slump in the oil industry? Cabinet Secretary. Um, I, I think that's why the short-term lets group has to, to work with all aspects of local government to uh, understand the pressures within different areas indeed. Uh, one of the main issues I think though we must consider is safety. Uh, and a safety issue in relation to short-term lets applies to people, whether they're visitors or indeed as the example that member has given, people who are working uh, in the industry and need the short-term lets for that basis. So that will certainly be, I'm sure, one of the issues that will be uh, considered as part of the group that we have established. Andy Whiteman. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. This summer I ran a consultation on an amendment to the planning bill to bring to strengthen the planning system in relation to short in relation to short-term lets. And Aberdeen City Council responded to that, saying that in the absence of planning or licensing powers, they'd welcome guidance from the Scottish Government on short-term lets. Further to that, they recognise the pressure that short-term lets place on housing, particularly without the checks and balances of the planning system. Does the Minister recognise the pressures that short-term lets place on housing? And does she recognise that there have to be limits? to tourism development in certain areas. Cabinet Secretary. Well, there are a number of aspects uh, to that. One of the reasons that there are short-term lets, and I know in my own constituency, is because of the lack of, of affordable social housing. And this government has made considerable strides, uh, and particularly compared to the rest of the UK, in building houses to make sure that we have that supply of housing in the first place. 
But he makes an important point about how we consider the balances that need to be uh, part of assessing tourism needs as well as those that are domestic uh, people, people in, their, in their own city needing to, ha to have uh, accommodation. And that is why the short-term lets group uh, is deliberating on that, although I do understand that the member has an amendment that's a part of the planning bill, and that's yet to be considered as far as I understand. Maureen Watt. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that in the government's work with local authorities on this issue, they will look into options to limit the number of days someone can rent their entire property and seasonal systems where the rules can be flexible to meet local demand, for example, when there are periods of large tourist demand? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, my understanding is that would be one of the considerations that will be discussed as part of the short-term lets group. I know it's a one of an issue that uh, Edinburgh City Council in particular has got an interest in and some of the uh, experience of other places in relation to limiting uh, 90 days, for example, is something that has been uh, part of this debate. So uh, the short-term lets group needs to, to do its work uh, and I'm sure we'll report to Parliament in the, in the appropriate, at the appropriate time. Question number two, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met the Scottish Tourism Alliance and what issues were discussed. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I met with the Scottish Tourism Alliance as recently as the 5th of September and the Minister for Public Finance and Digital Economy met with them on the 6th of September. Scottish Ministers have a number of discussions and meetings, both formal and informal, with the Scottish Tourism Alliance and its membership organisations as part of our engagement with what is a key economic sector. We discussed a variety of issues, all supporting the ambition of sustainable tourism growth for Scotland um, and that we share with Scotland's wider tourism industry. Claudia Beamish. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that the SNP leader of Edinburgh City, City Council supports the introduction of a tourism tax, as do COSLA. Berlin has it, Amsterdam has it, Vienna has it, amongst others, but Scotland does not. Analysis released today by the Edinburgh City Council shows that a year-round charge will raise an extra 11 million a year for the Council. With this in mind, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary if the Government has carried out any research on the impact of a transient visi visitor levy on tourism across the whole of Scotland, and if it hasn't, does it intend to, and when would there be any results to this? Thank you. Uh, the member raises an important point. I discussed that directly with the leader of uh, the City Council in Edinburgh just last week and I uh, know of the discussions that they've been having. But clearly, as the member points out, there are national implications of what might happen if, if, if that was to, to come about. Um, she also identifies, I think, some of the, the tensions and issues because uh, the cities that she uh, cites don't have a 20% uh, VAT rate, which currently applies to the tourism and hospitality indus industry here in Scotland. Um, in, in terms of uh, looking at the wider picture, we have been invited uh, by the Hospitality uh, Association and the SDA to engage in a national debate rather than necessarily being on a localised basis. And also she points out COSLA um, want to have this considered as part of a, the local government's review. So we're very conscious of these issues. Our current position remains um, that we are not in favour of introducing a visitor levy uh, unless the tourism industry itself is involved at the outset. But I do think that a healthy and informed debate would be helpful both for individual local authorities, but most importantly for COSLA and the national bodies representing the SDA. Gail Ross. Thank you, President Officer. Given the recent announcement of no special arrangements for EU citizens post-Brexit, can the Cabinet Secretary outline what impact she expects the UK government's migration plans will have on the tourism sector in Scotland? Uh, Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, the uh, tourism industry is one of our key sectors. Currently, 13% of those working in the sector come from EU countries. We want to support those who are here already, but we also want to make sure in the future we can continue to attract these workers so vital to our sector. Now, the UK government, as we understand, has agreed with the Migration Advisory Committee's recommendations that EU citizens should be treated exactly the same as other citizens um, in, in terms of application post-Brexit. Now, that would mean currently that you'd have to be earning within the tourism sector £30,000 to be able to be recruited uh, to work in that sector here in Scotland. That is just unsustainable. And we know already from the, the tourism sector themselves 
that the decision by the UK government, as we understand it this week, would have a catastrophic effect, practically on one of the key sectors of our economy. So that's why it's absolutely essential that one, the UK government listens, but secondly, they understand that it's possible to have a Scottish policy within a UK immigration system to make sure not only do we address the interests of our sectors like tourism, but also our challenging and very different population and workforce um, uh, background and considerations. So that's absolutely essential. Brexit is suddenly getting very, very real for many sectors and tourism is most certainly one of them. Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I just uh, draw members' attention to my register of interests as a shareholder in a small hotel? Uh, Claudia Beamish uh, asked about the tourism tax, but I would like to ask the Cabinet Secretary what her position is on whether she supports the transient visitor levy and when she will launch a Scottish Government consultation, because today the Scottish Tourism Alliance expressed their concerns about the introduction of a transient visitor levy by Edinburgh City Council. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, as I said, we have no plans and we are not supportive of a transit uh, levy um, and we don't think that that should be introduced unless there was involvement from the tourism sector right at the start and the sustainability of the tourism sector was considered. As I've said in my previous answer, a 20% VAT rate means that in terms of the comparators, we are perceived as a, a very high cost uh, location. And although the dev devalued pound is supporting tourism at this stage, um, I think in terms of the pressures that industry is facing in, a, in costs of other areas, that this is not necessarily an appropriate time for that to be considered uh, anyway. But I do understand that from both sides of the debate, and there are, are strong arguments, I can understand for I understand the strong arguments um, ag against it, but I do think having an informed debate is something that I would like to see happen and it's something that I would like to encourage. Claire Baker. Oh, thank you, President Officer. And can I ask the Cabinet Secretary if she's aware of the Unite Hospitality Charter, which is given um, to improve conditions for those working in the hospitality sector, and has she discussed this with the Scottish Tourism Alliance in order to improve working conditions for those working in hotels and restaurants across Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. The fair work agenda is something that should, the member will know that the, the uh, First Minister and the Scottish Government is very supportive of and indeed in our programme for government uh, we outline steps that we'd like to take particularly with the hospitality and tourism sector to, in, in relation to the fair work agenda and she refers um, to the campaign that has been established and I think it, and you know I need to check my notes but I think that's an issue that I have raised as part of that wider context of how do we take forward a fair work agenda um, in what is as I said one of our key industries but also one where we don't have people earning, um, we do have some people earning £30,000 a year, but on, a, on average that is not the salary that people currently are, um, are being paid within that sector. And so therefore we need to make sure that we, do th we can find me mechanisms and uh, policies to help support the sector, make it a very attractive um, career to be part of, but also to make sure that people are treated fairly. So there's a specific reference in our programme for government for that point. Question number three, John Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has for the funding of arts and culture to the south of the Central Belt. Camera Secretary. A range of arts and cultural activities south of the Central Belt is being funded by the Scottish Government's grant and aid to Creative Scotland. This includes three-year regular funding for the Wigton Book Festival, um, the Stove and Dumfries and Galway, and also Alchemy Film and Arts on the Scottish Borders. Local authorities in the south of Scotland also receive central government funding for cashback for creativity and the youth music initi uh, initiative programmes. In addition, the Scottish Government has provided direct funding of two and a half million pounds towards the development of a new purpose-built facility in Gala Shields to house the Great Tapestry of Scotland and 1.375 million towards the redevelopment of David Livingstone Centre in Blantyre. Uh, other government initiatives um, include uh, support in the Ayrshire and Borderlands growth deals and the South of Scotland Economic Partnership where cultural funding is a possibility. John Scott. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer, but she will be aware that for reasons best known to Creative Scotland, funding has not been available for Ayrshire and companies such as the Gaiety in Ayr, her hometown, but also across southern Scotland more generally. And notwithstanding what she has just said, can the Cabinet Secretary give assurances that this disparity of funding allocations will be investigated and addressed in Creative Scotland's own review, as well as the Scottish Government's culture strategy, which is also which it is also consulting on before producing its final report. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the member will be aware that uh, Air Gacy has received over £3 million of 
capital and revenue support in the last six years directly and indirectly from the Scottish Government and uh, I have been very supportive of Vera Gaithi and would continue to be so. Uh, he will be aware however of the independence of the decision making of Creative Scotland but I will make sure they are drawn, that his remarks are drawn to their attention as part of their review and he's quite correct to consider the culture strategy as means by which the importance of place and recognising the geographical dispersity of Scotland is something that is very important and that came, very, okay, came through very much in our consultation to date. The, the final consultation is just closed, uh, but I would expect to see a strong place agenda as part of that uh, when it's published. Question number four, Jackie Bailey. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to improve visitor experience by working with local authorities to enhance facilities such as car parking. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, last year, the First Minister announced the establishment of the £6 million Rural Tourism in Infrastructure Fund to help local authorities to provide immediate infrastructure support at tourist sites across rural Scotland. I'm glad to say that the first tranche of successful projects worth up to £3 million will be announced shortly, bringing much needed infrastructure improvements such as toilets, par parking, to benefit both visitors and local communities alike. And this is in addition to three pilots already progressed to deliver facilities on Sky and Orkney. Jackie Bailey. Um, and that is welcome indeed, but the Minister might be aware that Argyll and Butte Council is increasing car parking charges by 900% in Arica and considering introducing charges for the first time at Duck Bay as a means of increasing revenue. Um, it is a charge on tourists and local people alike, denies them particularly low-income people access to our countryside. And I wonder, does the Cabinet Secretary believe that this is in keeping with the Scottish Government's approach to outdoor access? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we clearly want to encourage outdoor access both for visitors and, and locals. I'm not uh, aware of the detail of the, the case she's putting forward. The funding that we're providing should be an additional to what is a, a successful and sustainable way to support the agenda of making sure that our outdoor spaces um, are accessible. So uh, I would encourage all local authorities, if they're expecting to receive Scottish Government funding for additional support, that it's not to uh, be replaced or indeed contradicted by other activity that they're involved in. So we have to take a holistic view of this, and I would encourage all local authorities to do that if they're expecting the Scottish Government to provide additionality to what they're providing themselves. Question number five, Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much. To ask the Scottish Government what analysis it has carried out of the potential for developing steam train tourism on the east coast of Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, a, tra a train journey around Scotland uh, can be one of the best ways of admiring our stunning landscapes. There are already a number of steam train routes across Scotland, including the Borders uh, Steam Charters, now operated by the Scottish Railway Preservation Society. And as recently as this month, the A1 Steam Locomotive Trust announced the Aberdonian, a brand new programme of five steam hauled trains between Edinburgh and Aberdeen, which will launch in March uh, 2019. So the Scottish Government encourages requests from steam operators to visit Scotland each year. There are many trips that take place through Scotland on the East Coast Line uh, from London, York and Newcastle to Edinburgh and to other parts in each of the last two years the Flying Scotsman has traversed this route very successfully and has been well patronised. Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much and I agree very much with the Cabinet Secretary that the launch of the Aberdonian on the East Coast Line between Edinburgh and Aberdeen uh, is to be welcomed starting next year. Does she agree with me that it would be even better if passengers were able to board the Aberdonian in Aberdeen? as well as in Edinburgh, so that people from both ends of the country can take full advantage of this fantastic initiative. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, unfortunately, my, my, my remit is wide, but it doesn't uh, extend to, I suppose, the ticketing operation in relation to the time timetables of railways. However, I think uh, the, the member makes a reasonable point and will draw it to attention to those that are operating um, that, that uh, service. Uh, oh, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, would the Cabinet Secretary support the idea of a special one-day James Watt service uh, involving Inverclyde and potentially the East Coast uh, to celebrate the bicentenary of James Watt in August 2019? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I think that's a very interesting su suggestion. I would strongly encourage potential operators to have early engagement with Network Rail as planning horizons within the industry uh, are normally agreed at least nine months in advance, but I would be very interested to hear of any proposals to recognise that very important bicentenary of James Watt. Question number six, Rhoda Grant, and the member did alert me to her late arrival in the chamber. Rhoda Grant. And I thank the presiding officer for allowing me to arrive late. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to support tourism in Sky. Cabinet Secretary. 
Government remains committed to ensuring that tourism in Skye, a vital part of the island's economy, remains sustainable. In November, at a tourism summit on the islands, I announced the establishment of a Skye Tourism Task Force. Work is being led by Highlands and Islands Enterprise, who are assisting the local authority industry group Sky Connect to develop a strategy and prioritise projects that will benefit tourism on the island. And as I referred to in the previous answer, um, I'm about to make announcements about the £6 million Rural Tourism Infrastructure Fund. Uh, we've already seen two of the initial three pilots on Sky, and the car parking at East Point has already delivered much needed benefits to visitors and the local community community alike and work on developing facilities at the ferry pool is progressing. Rhoda Grant. I'm not sure if the Cabinet Secretary is aware of um, what, um, visitors' behaviour around the, the ferry pools. We've seen photos of cairns being built all round in fields surrounding the ferry pool, pools where stones are being displaced and indeed small cairns are being uh, built and I know locals have been working to try and rectify that but what information is being given to visitors to those areas about how they should behave and protect the environment while they visit? Uh, what the member uh, raises is concern and I think it's part of how people behave when they're actually at uh, very important outdoor sites. Uh, obviously there's means by which people are engaging with locations to visit through digital media so I would encourage uh, all those who are advertising the ferry pools to indicate what is acceptable or not acceptable in terms of making sure that there's protection for a very precious and very beautiful place. Thank you and I'm afraid that concludes uh, portfolio questions today. We're going to move on to the next Point of order, Mr. Mountain. Presiding officer, far be it from me to criticise at all, but that we had some very long answers today, which stops backbenchers like me getting the chance to ask questions, which we've been preparing to ask on the results of applications from constituents. I had one to ask on Sky, and I eventually had one to ask on question nine, knowing there was little chance to get there. Could I ask the presiding officer if it would be possible to get Cabinet? Uh, secretaries and ministers to give shorter answers to questions so that we can answer more questions which are important to the constituents that we represent in Scotland. Thank you. Uh, point of order, Fiona Hizzle. Further to that point of order, um, I think in terms of uh, the management, I've worked very hard to answer as many questions as possible. The presiding officer also has discretion to take supplementaries, of which there were a number and extensive. And if the member wants to make sure that there are constituency issues addressed, perhaps John Scott, who had a, who had a specifically constituency issue, if he'd asked his question specifically about his constituency, I would have had a shorter answer rather than covering the whole of the south of Scotland. Thank you for both point of orders. I think the, the points illuminate an issue which is a difficult issue for everybody in this chamber, and that's getting the balance right between uh, making progress through the written questions and taking supplementaries. Uh, I would merely uh, emphasise today in particular that there were some long questions as well as long answers, and I would urge all members, as well as ministers, to be concise. Now we'll move on to the next item of business, which is, in fact, we'll just take a few moments for, uh, it's a statement from the Cabinet Secretary, we'll just take a few moments for members to change seats.